Hello, welcome along to the only podcast that has been recognised on both sides of the Andromeda Galaxy. This is the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you for listening. My name's Dan. This week you can hear about the most dangerous mountain in the world. And it might not be the one that you think as well. Also, we've got lots of space news to talk about. And you can learn how orcas are going rogue. First, let's check in with the smartest school outside of the solar system. Uh, they probably listen to this there, actually, because we are the greatest podcast in the universe. It's official. This is Deep Space High. Deep Space High. Space for all. Show me the door, and travel to Deep Space High, the school in space. But hurry, because lessons are about to begin. Morning class! Now we've been thinking about all the exciting jobs that you could do in the future and we've been finding out that space jobs aren't just for boffins building rockets. Space is for everyone. Whatever your interest, there's a job for you in space. So, stats, let's hear from you. What's your favourite topic? If it's stats, it's bound to be science. Well, duh, of course. I'm not top of the class in chemistry, biology and physics for nothing. Oh, right. And don't forget top of the class for boasting. (laughs) So, Stats, what is it about science that you like? Uh, well, I suppose it's because we get to do experiments, find out why things happen, how to change things. It's just something I like doing, even when I'm not in school. Knowing about physics helped me to modify my space scooter to be able to travel in nine dimensions. I didn't know there were nine dimensions. Cooking is basically experimenting too. I love coming up with new ideas like fizzy ice cream. And when I'm in my galactic greenhouse, I love trying to work out what will make my Neptunian nastatiums grow the best. But space travel isn't the time for inventing, is it? I mean, by the time you're ready to launch, you need to know what's going to happen. Not be doing an experiment into whether you'll make it into orbit or not. (laughs) On the contrary, experimentation is a huge part of space exploration. Not about whether your rocket works or not, although you need to know the answer to that, but space is a great environment to do experiments into other things. They're always carrying out experiments on the International Space Station, and there's no gravity there. Things behave in weird ways. That's right. Let's have a peek. Computer sim, ISS if you please. Ah, let's observe this experiment. The astronaut is wearing high-tech shoes which measure what's happening to her body as she exercises. Anyone care to guess why? Without gravity, the body doesn't have to work as hard to move. That can make muscles weak. I guess they're studying movement to help astronauts stay healthy? That's right. OK, computer. Next sim, please. Looks like these scientists are studying some vegetable seedlings. They want to see how the seeds grow up here and whether without gravity in natural daylight they might turn out different to on Earth. Why might we need to know that? I guess when we live in space, we need something to eat. And it's better to eat something that's easy to grow and doesn't mind being in space. That's right. As you can see, many experiments are to help us go further and stay in space for longer. But experiments undertaken in space can also help people back on Earth too. Scientists here on the space station once found that because of the way certain chemicals thrive in space, it was possible to make a new drug to treat muscular dystrophy. And on another occasion, from experiments with mice up here, they found a drug that can treat certain bone conditions. Right, let's get back. Computer, end sim. Science comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes, just like you lot. (laughs) And as we've seen, rocket scientists and astrophysicists don't have all the fun when it comes to space jobs. Biologists, chemists, ecologists, botanists, even psychologists can help make tremendous discoveries by carrying out experiments in the unique environment up here. Does it sound like something you might like to do, Sam? Not really, sir. I like things to be more... Predictable, I guess. As predictable as me coming top in class? All right, brains, that's enough. This lesson might be over, but don't worry, Sam, we're not done yet. Next time, I'll be asking for more of your favourite topics, so have a think. And have a think about leaving the room quietly for once. Deep Space High, space for all. With support from the UK Space Agency. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash space. 
Let's get to your questions then. This is my favourite part of the show. When you send in something sciencey that you can't figure out, you let me know about it. I do the work for you. Uh, if you want to get yours answered, you need to leave it as a review over on Apple Podcasts. Uh, a couple of questions to crack through today. Before we do that, uh, very quickly, thank you for everyone that has said congratulations and has wished me well over on Apple Podcasts uh, for our historic uh, award winning the greatest podcast in the history of the universe. I appreciate every single one of your well wishes. Thank you very much. Right, let's head to Kata first uh, uh, for Safa, who wants to know why the auroras make different colours in the northern and southern hemisphere. Now, we'll get to that in a sec. Um, let's just talk about how the aurora is made. I think we've covered it before, but it's always good to go over them because they look incredible in the sky. Have you seen these? They're around the polar regions of the Earth, the North and South Pole. The night sky can sometimes be filled with these waves of just immense, intense colours. Now, even though the sun is 93 million miles away, it's all because of that. Storms on the sun, they send gusts of charged solar particles hurtling across space. Now, if Earth is in the path of these particles, they will hit our planet's magnetic field and they react. The charged particles, they excite the molecules in our atmosphere and they light up. Uh, they light up because, because the electrons move further away from the nucleus of the atom. You're still with me, good. And then they move back towards it. These electrons are going back and forth, back and forth. And when that happens, they release photons of light. Works a little bit like a neon sign. Um, electricity excites the atoms in the neon gases, which cause the light. That's pretty much what happens in the sky. And different gases in the sky give off different colours. Uh, oxygen gives greens, nitrogen causes the blues and the reds. And the colours of the different northern and southern lights, it's because of the way the magnetic field, uh, the magnetic field line, sorry, it curves in different places. Um, that was quite, quite an intense one, wasn't it? Thank you for that, Safa. Uh, also talking about colours with Isaac, who's going to be eight soon. He lives on Reunion, ah, which is a volcanic island in the Indian Ocean. This amazes me for two reasons. One, Isaac, because you live, you're listening to us there. Also, because you live right next to a volcano. Uh, you want to know why fire is coloured red. Now, the colours of flames are because of two things. Because of what they're burning, and also how hot they are. Now, when wood burns, it can burn off copper compounds that are in there, sodium, carbon, hydrogen, and all of those give off different colours. Like gas on a cooker, that doesn't come through red, does it? It comes off as a blue flame. You get green ones as well. Uh, now, it'll be red because of one of the compounds that it's burning off on the wood, but when it's on a volcano, when volcanoes spew out lava near where you live, Isaac, it's because the flame is, the fire is so hot, scorching, it's boiling, baking, it's over 1,000 degrees Celsius. When something is that hot, uh, the flame, the, the fire, the lava, it becomes red. When it gets hotter, it can change to orange, and the hottest flame, which burns at almost 3,000 degrees, is white. Amazing, there's all these different colours, just because of gases being burned in a different way. Uh, thank you so much for the questions, you two. If you want something answered on the show, you need to let me know what it is. Leave it as a review for the Fun Kids Science Weekly over on Apple Podcasts. This week, we're learning about the Royal Society Young People's Book Prize 2020, a short list of six books, uh, some of the best young people's science books of the year. It's been decided by a whole load of absolute geniuses, and one of those is Professor Mike Kendall. He is a geophysicist, he is a fellow of the Royal Society, and he's on the line with us now. Hey, Mike. Hi, Dan. How are you? Yeah, very well. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, I'm looking at the names of some of these books, um, and I know because I've spoken to a few people for the show, people like Professor Barry Marshall, he's in there with How to Win a Nobel Prize. Um, talk to us very quickly about your role as a scientist in trying to decide just some of the best uh, science books for young people of the year. Yeah, it's been a, a very interesting uh, uh, procedure. I mean, obviously, we're trying to decide from a a really broad selection of books that I, I really have to emphasize are re generally really, really good. So it's a difficult task. It's also difficult because we're adults trying to decide what uh, younger kids would really like to read. But um, the idea is to take it down to uh, a short list and then we meet as a group and decide on which one is a bit different um, and maybe uh, presented in a way that hasn't, you know, it's a bit unconventional. We're really interested in books that 
might attract a much broader range of um, kids interest you know to get interested in science so how many science books were you presented with at the point think- and then you've whittled it down to to six and then I know that uh, a lot of kids all around the country are going to decide the best ones. So how many were you presented with? Well, we started, I, I started with, I think it was 104, something on that, that yeah. order. And we had to get down to a, a long, long list, uh, which got, was down to about 50. And then the, uh, each judge was then told to shortlist their 12 best, the ones they thought would be the favorites. And then when we got together, we had to distill um, that down to a final six. And that, it was quite an interesting procedure because you'd think, well, there'd be some commonality in the 12 that we picked or we chose, but there wasn't. There was often disagreements and it was really fun just to sort of argue about, well, this book's better for this reason and this one's better for this reason. So it was a very, really enjoyable experience. And because the quality of the books was so so good and there's so many of them, um, it was quite challenging, but we were happy with the six that we, we reduced it to. How much have you noticed when you had those initial 100 or so books, some similarities and some themes with the general topics? Do these things tend to come about in, in, in waves at the moment? Quite rightly, everyone's quite focused on the climate. Um, uh, and, and I also I see a book here in the shortlist. Uh, it's about the wonderful world of your microbiome. I've heard quite a lot about a microbiome this year. Do you tend to notice these ideas popping up uh, quite often, Mike? Yeah, there's, there's definitely trends. In, um, so there was a lot this year on uh, plastics. Um, and, and, and you're right, there's been an increase in books about, about climate and stuff. Uh, always uh, books about space are very popular, uh, especially with as big space missions um, um, come into, into fruition. So it can vary quite a bit. It doesn't necessarily mean, though, because the book's topical, doesn't mean it, it's well written or going to be necessarily chosen. Now, if it's all right with you, there are six books can we just run through them and you give us like a little short, very short summary and a blurb of each one? Oh, okay. So the first uh, one, uh, this is by Katie Brosnan. It's Gut Garden, A Journey into the Wonderful World of Your Microbiome. Yeah, now th- this is a, a fascinating book. Um, it, it talks about microbiomes and viruses are in that category. And, uh, you, you know, as we all know right now, uh, viruses are very important and can be actually beneficial, but they can also be very harmful. And uh, I think what's interesting about this book, it really shows how the, the complexity and, and um, uh, how uh, complicated the, this this world of, of, of biomes, microbiomes are. And in fact, in the book, it points out there's more sort of uh, microbiomes and viruses in your body than there are cells and by, by, by orders of magnitude. Um, and and I think it what's interesting about this book is the type of book that probably couldn't have been written 10, 20 years ago because we our knowledge of this subject is moving so quickly. And as you pointed out, it's something that we're hearing more and more about, you know, how these are so important for digestion and healing ourselves and how we operate day to day. It's amazing, isn't it? How we're always finding out new things, especially about digestion. You would have thought that might've been something that we locked down ages ago. (laughs) I remember from yoga adverts on the telly and, and they would talk about how they've got all this good bacteria in there and now we're learning actually maybe that's not the case and it's this microbiome that you need to think about uh, yeah. all of that just amazes me that we keep learning these things yeah this book even speculates you know looks at recent research that says what your appendix might be doing and why you know because we always thought that wasn't really a useful organ but it, it may in fact play some sort of role <laughs> it turns out it's useful after all um, Perhaps. right the next book is uh, is, is, li- is by libby deutsch uh, illustrated by valpuri katula uh, it's the everyday journeys of ordinary things the title is really hooking me in for this one mike tell us more yeah, this, this, I, I love these type of books. I mean, as a kid and even now as an adult, I love watching a TV show that shows you how something's made, you know, something you might use day to day, you know, like you might get a carton of milk out of the uh, fridge and just going back to, you know, <laughs> the journey from a cow, you know, feeding on grass to your fridge is quite fascinating. And it talks about all sorts of things like that, you know, how the internet works, uh, how GPS, you know, how you know where you are with your phone or your watch. Um, how mail is is distributed, you know how you know the whole process, and I think it's really important because it 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 shows 
people really, um, you know, the implications, what has to happen for you to turn on that light switch or to get a piece of fruit out of the fruit bowl. And um, so it just, it, it tracks the journey and shows actually really how amazing it is that you know, many of these things work as efficiently and as well as they do. And if you thought that name hooked me in, the name of the next one, Cats React to Science Fact. It's by Izzy Howell. Um, is it what it says on the tin? <laughs> it is. This this was a this was an interesting book. This is a book we we discussed a lot the, as as judges as Paul because um um it was a book. If you'd have told me shortlisted uh, when I first saw them, I was like, no, no, never. I mean, it, it's just just pictures of cats uh, <laughs> reacting to interesting facts. But actually, it's 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 really good. It, it has lots of um. Good, good. Uh, not only just interesting facts, but tries to explain to you a little bit about how things work, how the natural world works, um, and the cats just are, you know, there for amusement. And in the end, we agreed. Um, so one of the other judges, uh, she has younger children, and it was their favorite book. For example, uh, they just loved uh, you know, reading and learning uh, using it. And then in the end, we thought, well, if you know, some of these books are great, but they're going only going to appeal to young children, kids young adults who are interested in science already. And we wanted some books that would might hook people in that maybe were a bit intimidated by science or maybe not that interested in it. And I think this book does a great job of that. It makes lots of stuff, you know, about science and the natural world very, very interesting and accessible. Now, we, we, we spoke earlier on about how trends are quite important with books. Um, the next one is In the Key of Code. It's by Amy Lucido. Is that coding computer coding? Is it biological coding? Tell us more, Mike. It's it's computer coding. So this is a one of the we tried to pick a selection of books of different styles and types, and this one is is a novel. So it it's, it tells a story, and it's a very nice story. Uh, it's about a, a a young girl who who moves and starts a new school, and she's into music and and really has no no interest in coding or you know computer coding. Um, but sort of almost accidentally gets into this and makes a friend along the way and, you know, has a really good teacher. Um, and initially I sort of dismissed it as, you know, it's a nice book, it's interesting, but then actually as you read into the book and it goes on and on, it actually shows you the structure of coding and how it's sort of a very logical or what we'd say algorithmic. Um, and we felt this was a really good book because it showed, uh, um, you know, even if you're intimidated by it, it it's not that bad. And, and we're hoping that it would encourage people that maybe felt, well, coding computers, not really for me, um, that actually, you know, it, it, it can be fun and, and it, it weaves, you know, aspects of coding in with music. And it's just, it's just a really nice story and, and very cleverly done. Now, more about the titles of these things. The next one is uh, is by Professor Barry Marshall. Uh, he's been on the show. He's he's a favourite of ours with uh, with Lorna Hendry as well, illustrated by Bernard Kaleo. Um, and the title it's hooked me in mainly because I know that a Nobel Prize is worth something like a million pounds. I think it's uh, <laughs> how to win a Nobel Prize. Um, tell us about this one, Mike. Yeah. So again, this is a book that's a, a bit of a story. And I, I must admit it initially, I thought, well, it'd be interesting, but I don't think it'd be that good. And and actually, as I read it, it, it it's brilliant. And actually, my whole family uh, read it, and it was our number one choice of, of my household. Uh, and it just basically is, what I like about it is it shows that there isn't a, a, a tried and proven route to getting a Nobel Prize. Sometimes these things come around uh, not so much accidentally, but you make discoveries you weren't looking for. And it just shows you the, the what, you know, for me as a scientist, the real pleasure is you explore things because you're interested in them. Sometimes things work out in ways you didn't really expect. And, uh, and, and um, uh, it really describes that nicely. And, it, and it's basically a, a, a young girl, she, she um, meets all these you know, now dead <laughs> Nobel Prize winners because she can travel in time and stuff. Um, the other thing that's interesting about the book is the end of each chapter or section, there's a little experiment that you can do. And one of the ones I really loved was just how you can melt chocolate in a microwave. And based on how that works, you can estimate what the speed of um, the speed of light is. And, um, you know, lots of interesting things like that. So you're reading about these people's lives. You're also learning a lot about the actual physics or science behind behind their prizes. It was really good. Now, the last one on the shortlist, it's it's 
got me very interested because of, again, because of the title. But if you think in 2020, we've been stuck at home for quite a lot of it. No one's really been rushed to do anything unless you're trying to make a vaccine. You know, people are, have been pretty chilled out this year. Uh, the book is Astrophysics for Young People in a Hurry. Uh, it's by Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, who is a world famous uh, scientist with Jeffrey Moan as well. Tell us about this one, Mike. Yeah, th th this is another really good one, and it's quite um, different from the other ones that, that we've we've talked about. It, it really tells you, it's like an introduction to astrophysics, but it, it is more than that. And actually, yeah, it doesn't, you know, the title being young, for, for young people in a hurry is a bit misleading because it's, you know, you should take your time and savor it. But it's just so well written and so well presented. Um I was saying to somebody recently, I just love the, uh, the the first sentence in the book. is It says, in the beginning, nearly 14 billion years ago, the entire universe was smaller than the period that ends this sentence. So smaller than the full stop at the end of that sentence. It's quite staggering facts. But the, but he also he has little digressions, which I love, you know, asides about, you know, the earth isn't exactly round it's an oblate spheroid it's slightly flattened uh, things about gravity and just sort of how astrophysics is you know the, this juncture between what newton thought and then what einstein's think you know discoveries and it's just really really well laid out really i've, I've heard um neil degrassi tyson speak at, at conferences before and he's he's a really good communicator it's a it's a really good book so those are the six on the short list you've been in charge with with other people of, of putting these together but you're not going to decide the young the best book science book for young people of the year uh, how will that get figured out mike so so what the um the royal society does and and i should you know should, i think the fact that the royal society runs this competition is, is excellent it's really um a, a great thing um they, they will send um uh thousands of these books to uh children of the ages that they're intended you know between eight and 14. And then uh, because there's six quite different books in format, size, style, um, the idea is that the children will vote or the young adults will vote on which one they think is the best. And so it will be a by democracy, if you like. Um, and, and that recognizes the fact that maybe, you know, six adults aren't the best people to judge which one is actually the best one. <laughs> Well, it's nice that you can say that, Mike. Listen, um, brilliant work. I mean, those they, they all sound fantastic. I'm very excited to figure out uh, who, who people, who readers declare is, is the best book. Uh, Professor Mike Kendall, uh, geologist, ge geophysicist, sorry, and fellow of the Royal Society. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. No problem. Thank you. It's time for this week's Dangerous Dan, where we're talking about what they say is the world's deadliest mountain to climb. And it's not the one you think. It's not Mount Everest, which is the tallest on the planet. Uh, this one, it's lower, only slightly smaller, but apparently it's much more deadly, much tougher to summit. It's K2. You'll find it nestled between China and Pakistan. It's 8,611 metres above sea level, and it's nicknamed Savage Mountain because the weather it's terrible, it's unpredictable, with huge winds, freezing temperatures, whipping storms, avalanches, rock falls all the time. Also, very little of it is flat. And now Everest, um, even though that's really hard to climb, it flattens off for a bit, so you can have like a regular walk. But going up K2, it's mostly only sheer craggy rock face and solid ice, which comes tumbling at you down from the sky. Now, the higher you get up the mountain, the less oxygen is as well. Uh, you, you enter what they call, what the climbers call the death zone, which is where your cells start dying off because they've not got enough oxygen. Slowly, one by one, you get tighter, you get weaker. And over a quarter of people who try to reach the top of K2, they don't make it there and they don't make it back. It is a terrifying mountain. It absolutely deserves a place on our dangerous stand list, does K2. Time to head somewhere else deadly right now on the Fun Kids Science Weekly. This is the age of the dinosaurs. <laughs> Age of the Dinosaur with Dinosaur Action Magazine, the number one mag for dino fans. Welcome to the Cretaceous period, which existed between 65 and 144 million years ago. 
The world by this point was home to a wider variety of environments and species than ever before. And different species behaved in different ways, some preferring to live on their own, others liking the company of the herd. Uh-oh, let's hide. We've got company. Don't panic. It's a herd of iguanodons. They're plant eaters and more interested in the vegetation around here. They have to be, as they need to consume the equivalent of 300 bananas every day. Iguanodon fossils have been found all over the world, which means they were a common sight in Cretaceous times. They reached up to 11 meters in length and were experts at stripping greenery and fruits off plants. Cool! Did you see? It looks like they have hands. That's true. Iguanodons could stand on their rear legs and use their hands to grasp vegetation. A task made easier by their flexible fifth finger. They're on the move again. There they go! Bye! I like them. Fossils of many iguanodons have been found jumbled together in one place, which tells us that they moved in a herd with the adults likely to band together to protect the young from predators. But not all dinosaurs behaved this way. Yes, look at that poor thing over there. Maybe he's lonely. Don't worry, that's a Pinacosaurus, with plates of armour all over his back and an enormous club on the end of his tail. He can look after himself. That tail is perfect for swinging at anyone who thinks he'd make a tasty dinner. Armoured dinosaurs such as Pinacosaurus are known as ankylosaurs, meaning armoured dinosaurs. They were plant eaters too, like the Iguanodontians. But in fossil finds, there is usually just one of them, so they probably lived and died alone. Look, another herd, and these seem in a hurry. Quick, duck and hide. It's a pack of velociraptors. These sneaky hunters are carnivores and can bring down animals much larger than us. Not only do they have razor sharp teeth, deadly curved claws and an ability to run fast, they also have very large brains. They were believed to be intelligent enough to hunt together when necessary, outwitting their prey to tear it to pieces. That Pinacosaurus is flexing his tail ready. Quick, let's run! Paleontology, pick. Fossils have been part of the Earth for millions of years, and studying them is something paleontologists are experts at. Once larger rocks in an area have been cleared away, hammers, chisels and picks are used to tap at the Earth around the fossil to loosen it further. These pieces of rock and earth are called the matrix. Then a series of brushes from stiff to soft are used for delicate work. If the fossil needs to be moved, it's often wrapped in a plaster cast to keep it safe, just like the sort you would get if you broke your leg. The fine work of removing the remaining rock from the fossil then goes on back at the museum's laboratory. <laughs> Age of the Dinosaur with Dinosaur Action Magazine, the number one mag for dino fans. Let's get on with this week's Science in the News. NASA has started building the first space launch system on a launch platform ahead of its flight next year. Uh, it's the giant rocket that will send US astronauts back to the moon. It's hoping to get there uh, on 2024. Uh, engineers have been stacking the segments that make the two rocket boosters. Also, China has launched a mission to bring back rock samples from the moon. Uh, the robotic craft left the launch pad on a Long March 5 rocket early last week, and it should get back to Earth next month. The Chinese are bringing back soil and rock from the moon for analysis. And finally, rogue orcas are causing trouble in the Atlantic Ocean. The killer whales, in their pods, they've been ramming more and more yachts and boats off the coast of Portugal. And scientists, they're really thinking through, wondering why these orcas have started doing this more regularly. And that is it for the Fun Kids Science Weekly this week. If you've got a question that you want answered, 
if you just want to say congratulations because we won the award for the greatest podcast in the history of the universe you can do that leave it for me as a review over on apple podcasts while you're there it's one of the best places that you can hear loads of incredible shows and podcasts that we do they're on there they're also on the free fun kids app you can find them wherever you get your shows google spotify places like that and you can have a listen at funkidslive.com and fun kids were a children's radio station from the uk you can hear us all over the country on your dab digital radio on the free fun kids app and at funkidslive.com 